assemblies. I'll say that again. It looked like it hadn't started recording when I said that. If you didn't hear me the first time, welcome to the Philadelphia assemblies. Shalom on the Sabbath day. Just peace on the Sabbath. Okay. I've seen a lot of things going on on the internet like I always do. I guess this time, this particular rotation on the lunar calendar has the Sabbath falling on the seventh day Sabbath according to those that keep a lunar or rotating Sabbath. Not trying to be contentious with people, but, you know, make sure that whatever you believe that you're fully convinced on that, you know, when the Sabbath is, because the Sabbath is our mark or our sign, okay? It identifies us as Israel, as the commonwealth of Israel. So make sure you're fully convinced. And go and really read Isaiah 28. Now, I'm not going to go into it. I'm going to break this down when I get to Isaiah 28, you know, in my expository teaching. But it's talking about line upon line, precept upon precept. And in the beginning, first part of 28, it talks about must be. Now, let me tell you something. That word must, go back and check in an interlinear Bible or anywhere else, was added. Okay? When you look at that, it's talking about, you know, woe to the drunkards of Ephraim. Okay? And there's a lot that I'm going to be teaching as I come through a... Samuel and all these other books that you're going to be able to make connection with or I will as we go Okay, now you agree or not agree But Isaiah 28 and verse 12 and 13 talks about the rest which obviously it's talking about the Sabbath day and how they didn't Accept Yahuwah's Sabbath or you know and the most high Sabbath day and in Isaiah 12, it says that. And then Isaiah 13, now I'm par paraphrasing, so don't hold me word to word because I didn't go there, okay? It says line upon line, precip upon precip upon precip, line upon line. And, and it's talking about the fact that that's how Israel was led astray, okay? That's how they were trapped and snared and fell backwards. Now, because taking things out of context, you could take the scripture and you could take it out of context and you can make it say just about anything you want by pulling little precepts out of the book, out of context. And that, and I'm not saying you have to do that, but you can do that. And that's how they, you get misled by people that teach any doctrine that's not the truth. Now, do, does any one teacher have all truth? No. Anybody that tells you that, they're wrong. So I'm not judging people that see the scripture different as, than, than I do. What you really have to do is make sure that you are seeking the truth and following the Ruach, Kakadesh, the Holy Spirit, with your whole heart and doing what the word of Yahuwah says. And the only way you can do that, have an understanding of it, is you have to yield to the Spirit and get against the flesh, that pride and all those things that go along with that. And you, but you have to have a framework of the scriptures. If you haven't really studied the scriptures from Genesis through Revelation, now there's other books that are outside those, but I think you need to good, get a good handle on those 66 before you try to go anywhere else in any other scriptures. And you need to make sure that you're teaching what it teaches as it's in context and not taking it out of context and making it say something that we want to, whether someone else convinced us of that or not. Make sure that you read that book from Genesis to Rev to Revelation through Revelation and make those connections through the Ruach HaKodesh and, and be fully convinced. I'm fully convinced that the, the work of Yahuwah as far as creating and that's the Sabbath day, that's the feast days. That doesn't mean that everything had fallen into place yet, but it was created since the foundation of the world. And both in the book of Hebrews chapter uh, 4 in the New Testament, and in Genesis, it tells you that on six days, Yahuwah, or Yahweh, or Yehovah, created everything that was created, and on the seventh day, he rested. Now, my contention, main contention with all this is, number one, there's no place in Scripture that says that the Sabbath day, the seventh day Sabbath that was represents creation, was connected to the moon. 
Matter of fact, you know, the moon wasn't even created when they started in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And they don't, it doesn't get done until like the uh, fourth day. Okay? So he didn't say to start going by the moon once he created the moon. Now, the feast days in Mohadim are related to the moon. And, and, and Yahuwah's monthly calendar, it, monthly and moon, come from the same Hebrew word, and even the word Mohadim, okay? And that's talking about his high feast days. That's not talking about the seventh-day Sabbath. Again, in my humble opinion, okay? That when Yahuwah got done creating everything that was created, he already had said everything. And his calendar too, but he didn't set the moon in the firmament and the Shamayim or the heaven until the fourth day. And he never said to start recounting every time there was a change in the moon. He said, six days shall work be done. On, and the seventh day is the Sabbath of, the, of Yahuwah, okay, or Yahweh or Yehovah, whichever way you pronounce, okay? That's our opinion. That's going to be my opinion. And posting things on my wall, you know, hanging it on there or tagging me in things that are saying the opposite of that's not going to convince me to change my mind. I've already read all these scriptures and I can see where you're coming from with these scriptures, but I just don't agree that in context it says what you're saying. Okay? So if this continues and it becomes a point of contention, I'm going to have to block people from being able to post, tag me, you know, and have any connection with me so that they could tag me in their post because I'm not going to be convinced and I don't want you to use my page to full, you know, to continue something that I don't agree with. That's all. It doesn't mean that you don't have a right to teach what you're teaching. I fully get, support your right to teach, okay, as much as any right as I have. And you got a, a, a right to your opinion of the scriptures just as I do. We're going to continue our, my, our expository teaching in the book of Judges. We're on part five, and I'm going to start in chapter 16. I'm going to let time dictate because last week I said we were going to do three chapters. We ended up doing at least four, okay? But this is part five, and we're going to start in chapter 16. Today on Yahuwah's calendar, and again, in my humble opinion, today and this is part of the reason why you're seeing all these po these uh, lunar or rotating Sabbaths show up on the Internet is this cycle according to the way some calculate it. Because some calculated the Sabbath being on the 15th day and some on the 14th day according to whether or not they think the new moon is a Sabbath day or day zero. Okay, so today is the 15th day, in my opinion, of the... Uh, 11th month of the year 5779. So we're drawing down on the end of a decade. Okay. Just like on the Gregorian calendar, we now have closed a gap on a decade. They start in January, which is not scriptural. Okay. But the world's not scriptural. And we still live inside the world so that everybody knows why and what day we're on. We have to use that as a reference. Okay. Saturday's not in the scripture. Neither is Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. In the scripture, it's first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, preparation day or sixth day, and Sabbath. Okay? So just because you're keeping the calendar on a weekly cycle and not a lunar cycle, you're not doing something pagan. Okay? Matter of fact, you can look and find articles that say the opposite. You just be fully convinced on what you do. Okay? We're going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, we're going to open in prayer. And again, I'm sitting down. I don't want to get up and sit down and all that because I kind of got a small frame here at the house. Hopefully soon, not too much longer, it gets warm enough or we get funds. We're going to have propane and heat over there and we can return to the the uh, synagogue or the um, assembly, hall. assembly hall. You know, So we're, where we assemble. Okay, but until then, we're going to stay seated. The east is this way, okay, here. So, but we're going to just stay here because, you know, I can pray anywhere. I, I do know the scripture says turn to the east, and we would normally do that. 
but we're not. So, Almighty Father Yahuwah, we praise you in all things. We thank you for the understanding that you're continually pouring upon us. We ask that you would bless us and teach us, Father, and have us know the truth. Have all those that are seeking you, Father, seek you through your Holy Spirit, that Ruach HaKodesh, and not through some other man's interpretation of such. Now, that's why I believe, Father, and, and I pray that you're, you, you agree, and I believe that you do, that teaching in uh, this expository method, we're staying in context and less apt to be off. That doesn't mean that I got all truth by any means. Father, I just ask you would continue. You would correct me where I need correction and where I have truth, help it to be edifying. Not that I could teach the doctrines of men, but that I could treat your word right from this text and that it be edifying to the body to help build it up. We ask again that you would teach us and all, all things open our eyes and our hearts. We ask it all in, Yo, in Yahushua's name. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me, I've had a runny nose and a cold for over a week. I guess it's a cold. It's affected my voice a little, which I already had some problems, as you know, if you've been watching. But I'm going to struggle on. I'm going to try to get it uh, this uh, first lesson up as soon as I can. And then get a another one up, if possible, later in the day. So the earlier the better on this one. So let's go ahead and get started. Judges chapter 16, uh, verse 1. And we need to uh, understand and you know the word judges here could, again, I'm going to keep reminding us of this, could be deliverers. Because that's who, what he was doing. He was sending a deliverer to Israel as each time they fell away from Yahuwah, okay, and started doing what those around them were doing, okay, so kind of can make connect the dots on that, doesn't mean that they, that, you know, he wasn't judging Israel through them, he was, but he was also delivering them through these people, a lot of times it was just by war, Some, but a lot of times it was by the action of that one that's delivering them of going after Yahuwah with their heart with their whole heart, not every time, okay, because some of them didn't continue in it, they were going after other, um, Balaam, again, I am on the end of that, shows you that means other masters, okay, chapter 16, verse 1, then went Samson, we, we just covered a lot about Samson, and it almost sounded like it was summing it up and coming to an end, but it's not. Now we're going to get the final part of Samson, the deliverer of Israel. And the, and he was judge over Israel. And he certainly wasn't perfect, as we can well see. But Yahuwah worked through that imperfect vessel, just like he works through our imperfect vessels. So then went Samson to Gaza and saw there a harlot and went into her. Now, we all understand that. Don't need any further explanation. And it was told the Gazites, saying, Samson is come here, and they come, surrounded him in there. So he went in where she was, and there was obviously a lot more. He stayed overnight with her, and there was a lot going on in, in, in him, and laid wait, or so they, they were setting up a trap for him, for Samson, all night in the gate or the entrance of the city, and were quiet all night, saying, In the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. And Samson had made himself vulnerable through this sin. And Samson lay till midnight, and arose at midnight, and took the doors of the gate of the city, and the two posts, and went away with them, bar and all. So he tore down the, the gate of the city and put them upon his shoulders, and carried them up to the top of, of a hill that is before Hebron. So they thought they would trap him, but obviously Yahuwah through the Ruach, or the Holy Spirit, gave him more strength, and he just carried the whole gate up to the top of the a hill that was in Hebron. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah, 
And we all are familiar with Samson and Delilah. Even if you haven't read it, you've heard the stories from your parents and different places. And the masters, this little, this Lord Lord here, little L, is the masters of the Philistines, or Philistines, came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him, and see wherein his great strength lies, and by what means we may prevail against him, or we might overtake him, that we may bind him to subdue or afflict him, and will give the, give you there give you every one of his eleven hundred pieces of gold. So they were bribing Delilah to to, to get what the secret to Samson's great physical strength. And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray you, wherein lie your great... Second, these pages are sometimes hard to say. Your great strength lies. Wherewith, or wherewith you might be bound to subdue you or afflict you. So, obviously she was tempted by the bribe and took the bait. Okay, and when she did, now she thought she was really slick, and she didn't, I don't think, that, and that's just opinion, okay, that she really wanted to take Samson out, but she was willing to do what she did for the silver that he that was possessed. And Samson said unto her, if they bind me with seven green or seven fresh cords or vines, okay, very, seven of them, okay, seven's a complete number, and the more things you bind together, it's obvious the stronger it is, that were never dried, so that they were green, then shall I be weak and be, be as another man. So in other words, he told her that if you just bind me with seven cords, green uh, vines, that I won't be able to break them. I'll just be like any other man. Yeah, I wasn't. That wasn't true. But that's what he told her. Then you. Then the masters of the Philistines brought up to her seven green, okay, uh, uh, cords or um, vines, which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now there were men lying in wait, waiting or uh, abiding staying with her in the chamber. So they were hiding there in the chamber with her when she did this. And she said unto him, The Philistines be, are upon you, Samson. And he broke those green cords or vines, as it were a thread of straw is broken. When it touches the fire, so his strength was not known. So obviously he didn't tell her. And Delilah said unto Samson, Behold, or see, you have mocked me, or made fun of me, and tied me, and told me lies. Now tell me, I beg you, where, wherewith you're, you might be bound. And he said unto her, If they bind me tightly with new ropes that never were used, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Now, I don't know why she would believe this after the first time, but obviously he was he already knew she betrayed him once. Why would he tell her the truth here? Not necessary. She lied to him. Delia there now I'm telling you, you should always tell the truth and but in this case I can understand why he did that. He's not bearing false witness against his brother, he's just being sly as a serpent, but yet kind of harmless as a dove because he's not the instigator here. Then shall I be weak and be as another man. Delilah therefore took two ropes and bound him therewith and said unto him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson, and there will, and there were ambush, ambushers staying in the chamber. And he broke them from off his arms like a thread. And Delilah said unto Samson, Until now thou hast mocked me, and told me lies. Tell me wherewith you mightest be bound. Now why would he tell her? 
I mean, she's already betrayed him two other times. I mean, why would you think, well, it's because of her wiles, her feminine wiles. She thinks she's going to get in. And eventually, he breaks down. And it's Samson's weakness for women that he gets pulled by, back and forth by many different women, and that's it, what his downfall is. And he said unto her, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web, and she fastened it with a pin, and said unto him, The Philistines be upon you, Samson. And he awakened out of the, his sleep, and went away with the pin of the beam, and with the web. And she said unto him, How can you say you that I love you, when your heart is not with me? Well, I, I can see why he would say that. I mean, even if he did love her, why her heart's not with him either, is it? Thou hast mocked me these three times, and thou hast not told me wherein thy great strength lies. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily. Now she she uh, continued to be on him all the time. We know what Proverbs says about that. You know, there's not much thing, anything worse than a woman that's doing this to you. Or a man, either one, but a woman to a man, that's for sure, that's pressing on you all the time. Okay, and it, and it came, again, verse 16, And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that, his, that he was vexed unto death. He was just so upset that he was just like, Man, I might as well die if I'm going to have this woman vexing me like this every day. Then he told her all his heart and said unto her, There have not come a razor upon my head. For I have been a Nazarite unto Elohim, not Yahuwah, but Elohim, from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength. Yep, thought I heard somebody at the front door. I'm sorry. Then my strength shall be gone. I got to find where I was. Shaven, then my strength will be gone from me. And I shall become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah said that he had told her all his heart, she went in and called for the masters of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart. <coughs> and she betrayed him again. Then the masters of the Philistines came up unto her, and brought her money in, in their hand. And she made him sleep upon her knee, her knees. And she called for a man. And she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him or subdue him. And his strength went from him. And she said, The Philistines be upon you, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before, and shake myself. And he knew not that Yahuwah was departed from him. So he didn't know. He thought that even after this, that, you know, Yahuwah would still be with him through the Ruach. And that wasn't to be because he had trusted in her and not trusted in Yahuwah. Because two of the things a Nazarite wasn't supposed to do was what, you know, being with all these women and drinking wine, and eating grapes, and eating anything, anything unclean, and he had done all of those. But the Philistines took him, and put his eyes out, and brought him up, him down to Gaza, so poked his eyes out, and brought him down to Gaza, and bound him with, with chains of brass, and he did, <coughs> I knew that was coming, sorry, <coughs> And he did uh, grind in the prison house, okay? So he was in there, and he was in dire distress in the prison house, and he had his eyes plucked out, or poked out. Not very good. Sorry, my nose is trying to run. Sorry.
going to lead to more sneezing if I don't take care of it. Might anyway. So here he is in prison, and, you know, he's bound, and, you know, his eyes are poked out. Verse 22, however, the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. So guess what? Starting to get a little strength back because his hair is regrowing. Then the masters of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon, their Elohim. Word God here, and if you're in the King James, little g is Elohim. Okay? And to rejoice, for they said, Our Elohim hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. Okay, and Dagon was the chief god, but they had more than one, just like most of these people did. Okay, and when the people saw him, they praised their Elohim, for they said, Our Elohim have delivered unto our hands our enemy and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. Remember last time we were talking about how he slew, slew a thousand? Okay, so he slew many in his life. And it came to pass when their hearts were merry that they said, Call for Samson that he may amuse them, okay, or make, they can make fun of him. And they called for Samson out of the prison, and he made fun, and they made fun of him, and they set him between the pillars of the temple, those the support beams, the things that hold up the whole temple. And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me, or permit me, that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house stands, that I may lean upon them. <clears throat> now the house was full of men and women, and all the masters of the Philistines were there, or the leaders of the Philistines. And there were upon the roof about three thousand men and women, that be what beheld while Samson, or they looked down while Samson was made fun of. And Samson called unto Yahuwah and said, O Yahuwah Elohim, remember me, I pray you, and strengthen me, I pray you, only this once, O Elohim. And actually, I need to really look that up. I, I doesn't have it in, I don't have it marked here in my uh, sword Bible that I like to teach from, but I'm pretty sure this word is Eloah and not Elohim both times here. So it, this should have been read. And Samson called into Yahuwah and said, O Yahuwah, Eloah, singular, remember me, I pray you, and strengthen me, I pray you, only this once, O Eloah, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. <clears throat> now, it doesn't really make that much difference whether it's singular or plural there because Yahuwah is not going to do it himself, but Yahuwah is the one who's going to allow it to happen. He's going to use the Ruach within him to restore his strength. In other words, the Ruach wasn't on Samson continually. He came to him at, at times when he needed it. You, you could see that in the scripture if you're looking. He, you know, when he needed great power, great power came upon him, and he had great power. He didn't always have it continually. He was strong, but not as strong as he was at times, like when he killed a thousand with the jawbone of an ass. I mean, that, that wasn't humanly possible, but the Ruach within him made that possible, okay? So if it's plural, then that fits, but I, I'm, I'm almost sure that once I read that, and it was singular there, pointing towards Yahuwah being the one that answered him through the Ruach. Okay, 29. And Sam, in other words, he didn't answer him with his mouth. He used the voice, his voice, which is his spirit, the Ruach. And Samson took hold of the two middle pier, pillars upon which the house was supported or stood, and on which it was held up, says born up in the King James, but that means held up of the one with his right hand and of the other with his left hand. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And, he, and he's praying to Yahuwah. He's saying, let me die with the Philistines. Philistines, I, I can't see, I'm blind, I'm not going to be of much help, so 
let me die because he knew he had sinned these many times and he was ready to be finished. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might. And the house fell upon the masters or the leaders and upon all the people that were inside or therein. So the dead which he slew at his death was more than they which he slew in his entire life. Then said, then his brethren and all the house of his father came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zoar and Ashtahol. I'll get it right. <laughs> In the burying place of Manoah, his father. And he judged Israel, or he delivered Israel, and he judged Israel 20 years. Chapter 17. And there was a man of Mount Ephraim, which name was Micah. And he saw, and he said unto his mother, The 1100 shekels of silver that were taken from you, about which you cursed and spoke of also in my ear, in my ears. Behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be you of Yahuwah, my son. And when he had restored the 1100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I fully dedicated the silver unto Yahuwah from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image or a carved image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto you. Yet he restored the money into his mother, and his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the, to the silversmith or the founder, who made thereof a graven image and a carved image, and they were in the house of Micah. So here we are, false Elohim, okay, in the house of Mike, or Balaam, in the house of Mike, Micah, okay. And the man Micah had a house of Elohims. And the man Micah had a house of Elohims. And made an ephod, or a priestly garment, and a teraphim, okay, the, and teraphim, or household idols, or, or graven images, and consecrated one of his sons, or his Ben, whom became his priest to these false idols that he had. And those, so obviously, you know, Israel had still not come really truly to Yahuwah, you know, through the Ruach or any other way. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Because at that time, Yahuwah was supposed to be ruling, but they weren't accepting his rule. They were rejecting him over and over again, as they would continue to do so until they were completely cut off as a nation, not individually. But every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Yehuda. Okay, Bethlehem is the is the city. That's the city where our Messiah was born. Okay, and where many other rulers of Israel were later born in the area that was possessed or inherited by the tribe of Yehuda or Judah, of the family of Yehuda, who was a Levite. Okay, now listen to what it said. And there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Yehuda. Of the family of Yehuda, okay, who was a Levite, and he so and he surjoined there. Now that's kind of contradicting itself. If there, if he somehow wasn't part part of the family of Yehuda or Judah, as well as part of the of the family of Aaron or Levite or Levi. Okay. He had to be because it said who was a Levite and he lived there. Okay. He lived in Bethlehem, Judah or Yehuda because it says he's of the family of Yehuda. Can't, you know, if, if it's only through the male 
that the lineage is drawn, this can't make sense here. Okay? So he was of the family of Yehuda. That means possibly his mother was of the tribe of Yehuda, and they lived there in Bethlehem, Yehuda. But he was a Levite, and that probably meant his father was a Levite. And he lived in Bethlehem, the city of Bethlehem in the area or the area that was inherited by Yehuda. Verse 8, And the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Yehuda, to stay where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, as he journeyed. Now, said he was a Levite. It also said he was of the family of Yehuda. And he went to the mountain of the Mount of Ephraim, to the house of Micah as he journeyed there. And we know why we already got all the history of Micah. We know who his dad was. And Micah said unto him, From where did you come? And she said unto him, I am a Levite. And he said unto him, I said she, I'm sorry. And he said unto them, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Yehuda, and I go to stay wherein where I am found, where I may find a place. He's looking for a place to stay. And Micah said unto him, Stay here with me, and be unto me a father and a priest, and I will give you ten shekels of silver by the year, and a suit of apparel, and your and your provisions, or your food. So the Levite went in. And the Levite was content to dwell with a man with the man, and the young man was unto him as one of his ben or sons. And Micah consecrated the Levite, okay, or, you know, set him apart from all the rest. And the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Then said Micah, know now that I, that know now I, that Yahuwah will be good, seeing I have a Levite to my priest. Hmm. You see, some these guys might not even have really truly understood that they were doing something wrong, okay, by having these Balaam or false Elohim with, amongst them. Because just like back in Genesis, you know, uh, when actually Exodus, I'm sorry, back in Exodus, when Aaron made the two calves, you know, it, it's not just one, he made two golden calves. Go back and check it, that's plural back there. Okay, every time. Okay, and they were doing them to be representative of Yahuwah and the Ruach Kakadesh, Yahuwah's spirit. Even though I'd never seen Yahuwah, and that's one of the reasons why you, you can't make an image, because you've never seen him. And nobody had even fully seen the Ruach. You know, some had seen his back parts as he had passed by. You know, but it, the, the scripture did say that Moshe spoke to him face to face. So maybe Moshe. OK, but people, it still wasn't to make an image of, of him. OK. OK, chapter 18. In those days, there was no king in Israel, as we already know that still. In those days, the tribe of the Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in. For unto that day all the, their inheritance had not fallen unto them among the tribes of Israel. So Dan hadn't received their, all their inheritance. And the Ben, or sons of Dan, sent their family five men from their uh, coast or the area that they were living in. Men of valor from Zorah and from Estuol to spy or to, you know, search out the land and to search it that they said unto them go search the land who when they came to Mount Ephraim to the house of Micah they lodged there when they were by the house of Micah they knew the voice of the young man the Levite and they turned to there and said unto him who brought you here and what makes you in this, and why are you in this place? Place is added, but it's like, man, you're here with these false idols. Why are you do? and what have you, 
and what reason and what do you have here? Why are you here again? And he said unto them, Thus and this dealeth Micah with me, and hath hired me, and I am his priest. Now, we all know that you shouldn't be hiring a priest. That's a problem even still today. You know, not saying that you shouldn't give a tithe into Yahuwah. I don't believe that at all. But if you're literally paying your priest, I think that could be a problem. Because then he's going to do pretty much as you want him to do. Because if not, you're going to cut off his food. Okay? Or his pay. Okay? So this is really a problem. And he just straight up admits it. He was to do that. And he's doing this thing he shouldn't be doing. And... And they said unto him, ask, verse 5, you need to get inquire, we pray you, of Elohim, big G, that we may know whether or our way which we go shall we, be pros shall we prosper. And the priest said unto them, go in peace before Yahuwah is your way wherein you go. Then the five men departed and came to Laish, Laish and saw the people that were therein, how they dwelt, why they dwelt careless after the manner of the Zodanians. Zod, Zod, okay? People of the land. They dwelled like them, quiet and secure, and there was no magistrate or no law in the land that might be put to shame anything. In other words, they, anything went. Okay, kind of like Sodom and Gomorrah. And they were far from the Zidonians, 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 and had no business with any man. And they were, it was kind of like a no man's land. And they came unto their brethren to Zorah and Ashtola and their brethren and said unto them, What say you? And they said, Arise, that we may go up against them. For we have seen the land, and behold, it is very good. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? It is very good, and you are still, are sitting still. In other words, why aren't you going up? But not be not slothful, slothful to go up and to enter to possess the land. When you go, you shall come into a, into a people secure and and to a large land, for Elohim hath given it into your hands, a place where there is no want of anything that is in the earth. And there went from, from there of the family of the Danites of Zorah, and out of Ashtol, six hundred men appointed with weapons of war, and they went up and camped in Kajeth, Kayeth Aram in Yehudim, in Yehuda, okay, in the area of Yehuda, wherefore they called the place Mahanadam unto this day. Behold, it is behind Kahath Aram. <laughs> I'm butchering that, sorry. Verse 13, and they passed from there into Mount Ephraim and came into the house of Micah. Then, then answered the five men that went to spy out the country of Laish, and said unto the brethren, Do you know that there is in these houses an ephod, a priestly garment, and Elohim, or graven, and you know, false gods, and graven image, and molten image? Now therefore, consider what you have to do. And they turned from there, and came to the house of the young man, the Levite, even into the house of Micah, and saluted him, or greeted him. And the six hundred men appointed with their weapons of war, which were of the Ben, or sons of Dan, stood by the entering of the gate, okay, and the five men that went to spy out the land went up. Sorry, I used that little okay there, I don't know where that came from. That wasn't in the scriptures. And the five men that went in to spy out the land went up and came in there 
and took the graven images or the false idols and the priestly garment and the teraphim and the molten image and the priest stood in the entry of the gate with the 600 men that were appointed with the weapons of war and these went into Micah's house and brought the carved or graved images the ephod and the teraphim and the molten image then said the priest unto them what do you or what are you doing and they said unto him hold your peace lay your hand upon my your mouth and go with us and be to us as a father and a priest is it better for you to be a priest unto the house of one man or that you be a priest unto a tribe uh, and a family of Israel and the priest heart was glad and he took the ephod okay and the teraphim and the graven image and went in the midst of the people so they turned and departed and put the little ones and the cattle and the riches before them and when they were good when they were a good way or quite a ways off from the house of Micah the men that were in the houses near to Micah's house were gathered together overtook the sons of Dan. And they cried unto the sons of Dan, and they turned their faces and said unto Micah, What aileth you? What, are you sick? What's wrong with you that you came with such a company? And he said, You have taken away my Elohim, Micah which I made and the priest and you are gone away and what have I more and what is this that you say unto me wait what aileth me what's wrong with me he said what's wrong with you and the sons of Dan or the Ben of Dan said unto him let not your voice be heard among us least angry fellows run upon you and you lose your life with the lives of your household and the sons of or ben of dan went through went their way and when micah saw that they were too strong for him he turned and went back into his house and they took the things which micah had made and the priest which he had made had what priest which he had and came into laish unto a people that were peaceful and secure and they attacked them with the edge of the sword and burned the city with fire it's kind of like people with power do today to people when they find them living in peace and not bothering anybody else and there was no deliverer no one to save them because it was far from Zidon and they had no business with any man and it was in the valley that lies by Beth Rahab that they built a city and dwelt therein and they called the name of the city Dan after the name of the Dan, of Dan their father who was born into Israel however the name of the city was Laish at the first and the Ben of Dan set up the graven image and Jonathan the, the Ben of Gershom the son of Manasseh he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land when they went into Babylon. And they set them up Micah's graven image. And it, it might not be Babylon. They might be talking about when they went into Philistines here because they've been in captivity many times, not just Babylon. And they set them up Micah's graven image, which he made all the time that the house of Elohim was in Shiloh. Okay. So that's the end of this chapter. It's 49 minutes. Let me look and see how long chapter 19 is. I think we'll go ahead and stop that one there so I can go ahead and get this one up on the internet. So, again, any comments, concerns, even criticisms, you know, you're welcome to uh, send us emails at Philadelphia Assemblies, I-E-S, plural, at, at, 
not we haven't been Yahoo for a long time at gmail.com and may Yahuwah bless until we meet again. Shalom. <laughs>